Hello everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Paul Pierce. Um, I'd like you to welcome you to our wellbeing and, and technology presentation. Uh, it was presented by my colleague Roger Ayres. We're both from Me Learning. Um, I've been working for Me Learning as an account manager for the past three years um, and we've been helping uh, Hounslow with their liquid logic training or the digital training which helps their liquid logic adult system and their liquid logic children's system. Um, so that's just a brief introduction for myself. I'm going to be uh, keeping an eye on the Q and A's as they come in. Um, if you've got any, please pass them through and um, I'll pass you over to Roger and he will be able to answer your questions and uh, talk about your well-being. So without further ado, I'll pass you over. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, for inviting us to come and talk to you this afternoon. Uh, delighted to be in contact with Hounslow. Many, many years ago, I lived uh, for a year in and around Hounslow and Osterley and Isleworth and uh, brings back good memories for me. So uh, uh, very nice to be here this afternoon. And um, the, the subject that we're going to talk about is well-being and technology. And are they compatible? Uh, are they mutually exclusive? Um, so hopefully I want to make this as helpful as possible for you. I'm going to share some thinking with you, share some expertise, some ideas, but as Paul has already indicated, we want you to get involved. We want you to uh, put some questions up on the Q&A function, which I think you're all familiar with, uh, and then um, we can make this as useful as possible for you. So Methuselah, was a biblical character. I'm not a religious man. Methuselah, a, who allegedly lived to the ripe old age of 969. And this is pretty much how my daughters see me uh, as an old non-tech savvy individual who doesn't really understand the world we're living in. And uh, they're probably quite close to the truth, to be honest. Uh, hands up confession. I don't really claim huge expertise in technology. I can manage virtually what we need to manage day to day, but beyond that. Um, but that's why I think it's a reasonable place for me to start, because even for us non-tech savvy people, uh, that can help with our well-being, etc. So let me tell you about last weekend. Move on to this image. I have two teenage daughters, one of which is 14. That's not an accurate depiction of her on the left of the screen, uh, but uh, you know, so, uh, dare I say, she portrays some typically teenage behaviours. She wants to spend most of her time in her room on her own, apart from when she comes out to eat, uh, speaking to people on her phone, looking at nonsense on YouTube, etc., etc., etc. So, me being the father I am, I try to encourage some activity. And so last weekend I said, come on, you know, we live down in Sussex, which is a beautiful place to live down by the sea in the South Downs. I said, come on, let's go on for a walk. And I plotted it all out and I packed a picnic uh, and she really didn't want to come. She really, really did not want to come. But uh, I think guilt more than anything else and a bit of insistence from me meant we went out for a lovely windy walk up on the South Downs and reluctantly Reluctantly, she admitted to me when we got back uh, over a bowl of hot soup that actually it was rather nice to get out uh, and get some fresh air. So why, are we, why am I telling you this story? Well, that's typical of people's approach to well-being. OK, I do a lot of uh, research and training courses around psychology and behaviours. And what we find is well-being is something that people you know, know they should be doing, but don't necessarily make time for it, put it in their routine. So where are we heading in this 30 to 45 minutes? This is the structure of where we're heading. So why now? Why is well-being really important right now? Obviously, the pandemic has changed the world very quickly, so we're living in a virtual world. So why now? Uh, then there's actually crucial that we control what we can do about it. We can't control the pandemic. We can't control what the government allows us to do. But there are some things that we can choose to do to help our well-being and the well-being of those around us, colleagues, friends, family, etc. So we can make some choices around this stuff. 
a little section on why we don't do what's good for us. Uh, so I'd share with you some thinking and some theory about that. And also some crucially some choices we can make either with technology uh, and I'll come to that later in the, the discussion, but also things we can do without the use of technology. And it's a lot of it is about reconnection, doing something physical, doing something social, doing something with our mindset, but also embracing the technology behind things. So that's where we're heading during the next 30 minutes or so. So why now? Over 730,000 people have lost their jobs in the UK since the 23rd of March. It's probably a lot higher today. That was the last number I could find. Many working lives, home lives have been disrupted. A lot of changes happen. Uh, I personally, um, you know, suffered a redundancy early in the year. Uh, and delighted to be working with me learning. So a lot of change has been forced upon us. Uh, and of course, those people still in a position uh, in the workplace uh, find that they're taking on more responsibility, their role has changed, the demands on their time to convert things to technology has changed. So lots of change has been foisted upon us, which we haven't asked for. So why is it so important? Well, well-being, it improves our mental health, so our resilience, uh, our capacity to be able to connect and achieve things. It improves our confidence. And if we're feeling more confident, that breeds confidence in others. So if I'm showing up as confident, then people are more likely to see me as confident, encounter me as confident and have confidence in what I do. That has a knock on effect to self-esteem as well. One of the key factors of well-being. If we're telling ourselves that we're OK, actually, we're doing OK and we believe it, that's really important. If we're telling ourselves that life's a disaster and there's nothing we can do, uh, then that has a, a negative effect on our well-being and the impact we make in with our stakeholder community. And of course, if we're just being purely work focused about it, we're more productive when we're looking after our well-being. So absolutely crucial that we look after our well-being and those around us. So I'm going to ask you a question and I'd really encourage you to get involved in the Q&A function uh, because the way we stro show stress is different. OK, for me, I tend to internalize stress uh, quite old fashioned about that. I, I internalize stress and I tend to just uh, remove myself um, from social interactions. I know that's not a good idea, but that's just my habit, my uh, thing that I do. So in the Q&A function, I'd just like you to type in uh, how does stress show up for you? And I'll leave that for a second or two. Sure, if we've got any questions coming through at the moment. It's very interesting the different personalities and preferences that show up with stress. So there's one model of personalities that show uh, that um, w if you're the sort of person who expresses yourself a lot when you're in stress, you might attack actually. So you might attack in an expressive way, not physically attack, we hope, but you might blame others attack. Uh, other people when they're under stress or pressure, uh, what we call go into an autocratic mode. Ah, we've got we've got a comment it says I get headaches and short tempered. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, and of course, yeah, so what, what can we do about headaches and getting short tempered? Well, the great thing about dealing with stress is just telling yourself and becoming aware of your triggers and where you go to under pressure is half the battle. Uh, so just awareness deals with your capacity to deal with it. So obviously there are many answers to how you deal with headaches. Might be a, might be a bit of fresh air, might be a bit of hydration, might be just taking a deep breath to manage your temper if that's how things goes. Not focusing and putting other things. Not sure I can read all of that. Uh, 
uh, not focusing and putting other things. So yes, our mind gets busy and our mind gets distracted. So uh, they've done some brain scans actually over the years and the average adult has over 10,000 conscious thoughts a day. 10,000 conscious thoughts a day, OK? The old joke is that men have about five or six, but I won't share that old joke. Uh, uh, but they've done brain scans, but also they've done brain scans of people who are stressed. Uh, and actually the brain activity goes up massively. Uh, and we're actually dealing with millions of pieces of sensory data every second. So we're very, very, very busy in our minds, particularly when we're under pressure. And so you're 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 not alone in thinking that. And so some of the art around managing that is to quieten the mind, practice mindfulness, which will come to it so we can deal with things in a positive way. So thank you for sharing that. Getting emotional and crying. Yeah, uh, eat a lot. Yeah, so often we we derive some comfort and crying is a magnificent thing. OK, I was running a course uh, a couple of years ago for a, a group of global leaders in a, a big engineering business I was running a course for. Uh, and I'll never forget um, one of the women in the room. There was about 25 to 30 leaders from around the world in this organization. And one of the women in the room said, I get so frustrated in internal meetings that uh, in fact, last week I got so frustrated. I left the meeting. Uh, I went to, to the ladies room and I had a good cry to get all the stress out of the system. And you could see a lot of the men in the room were, were sort of rolling their eyes a little bit and saying, oh yeah, 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 typical, typical. Until this big Texan fella stood up and he was about six foot four. And he said, yeah, I do that. And then it stopped the whole room. And everybody was going, Stan from Texas cries. And he went, no, I don't cry. He said, I bang the table, but it's the same feeling underneath. He said, I get so frustrated in those meetings, but I just express that emotion in a very different way. So it's great. Crying can be a very cathartic thing. Eating, you know, obviously uh, we, we a lot of us have a relationship with food where, where we find comfort in it, but we know that stores up some problems down the line if we overdo that. Um, so there might be some different techniques you can deal with. Uh, yeah, some people go inwards, internalize, internalize their thinking uh, and that can eat away at you. OK, uh, some people get panicky and anxious uh, sleep. OK. That's fantastic. So what I, I don't know who wrote sleep. I don't know whether that means you go to sleep or you lose sleep. Um, often people can't sleep when they're stressed uh, because it affects their thinking patterns or just a general feeling of low. So uh, yeah, eating more food or getting ill. So it does have a physical, a visceral effect on the body when we're feeling low. So uh, thank you for sharing that and I will try and um, answer some of those questions as we go through and we'll give you more opportunities to have a look at that as we go through. So yeah, stress shows up for different people uh, and it's quite hard when you're being attacked uh, or somebody's you know, not talking or communicating with you to realize that they're probably feeling stressed. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an art of coaching, which I really like. I love this phrase, it's called unconditional positive regard, unconditional positive regard. And what that means, psychologists will tell you, is that everybody's acting for their own best reasons. The assumption is that unless you're a malevolent human being, which I doubt that you are, that you're acting for your best reason, you just show that in a different way. So don't despair though, because there's such a lot we can do about it. And actually, you know, in my lifetime, I was born in 1967. I know I don't look old enough, but uh, yeah, but actually it's much more socially acceptable to talk about mental health and well-being than it's ever been, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, and, and to admit our vulnerabilities, and that's half of the battle in dealing with it. So there's still so much to do. So before I move on, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to share with you a story. I was on a, a virtual conference with a man called Mo Gaudat. 
a couple of weeks ago. Now his story is very interesting. He used to be a very successful uh, technology officer at Google X, uh, hugely successful career wise, uh, earned a lot of money, had all the trappings that went alongside that. Uh, but he kept getting this sense that he wasn't happy, he wasn't fulfilled. Uh, and so he started to investigate that. Then he had a, suffered a personal tragedy, he lost his son suddenly. Uh, and through that, he developed for those scientists among us an equation for happiness, an equation for happiness. And the way he shared it was this. So let's just think about, for example, the pandemic and the lockdown. It's the most relevant thing in most of our lives at the moment. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but I have mostly quite enjoyed lockdown in the sense that uh, I'm spending much more time with my family than I ever did. OK, I, I'm actually a, a fairly shy introvert, so being out and about in meetings um, is quite tiring for me. Uh, and I'm not getting up at five o'clock every day to jump on a train to get into London and then travel all over the place. So mostly I have had a positive experience of lockdown. You speak to other people and they've absolutely hated it. You know, they miss the social side of things. They miss the routine uh, of coming into the office or the workplace, the social interaction with others. Uh, actually, some people flourish in a more noisy, uh, busy atmosphere. And so this, um, this example shows us that actually the lockdown in itself is what we call a neutral event. It's just a simple neutral event and it is neither intrinsically good or intrinsically bad. And this is the, the stem of Mo Gaudat's equation for happiness. So there it is on the screen right now. So his research, and he's done much more research than I have just talked about, is this. He says happiness is greater than or equal to your perception of the events of your life, i.e. the lockdown on this occasion, minus your expectations of how life should behave. OK, so I'll just repeat that. Happiness is uh, greater than or equal to the events of your life, which is a neutral minus your expectation. So if your expectation is, well, this is this is a breath of fresh air, my expectation, then lockdown has largely been OK, it's been happy. If your expectation has been, this is a nightmare, I expect everything to be back as it was uh, and I can't wait to get back, then you're likely to be tipping the scales towards unhappiness. OK, so that's in very quick measure the, his equation for happiness and then he's written a book. He's got a very successful podcast called Slow Mo um, if you like to study that. So that's his equation for dealing with it, that the event is neutral. Your expectations are manageable. And of course, uh, the answer is not just to lower your expectations about everything. Uh, that's not the answer because that will grind you down after a while. But there is a uh, uh, a good study in being realistic about how we expect life to be. Now, I don't know about you. I, I, when I'm at work, planning is not my favourite thing. Planning is not my favourite. I know I should do it. I know I shouldn't leave things till the last minute. It's something I know I should do, but I just don't do. And it's a bit like looking after ourselves and others. Sometimes, particularly ourselves, we know we should focus on our well-being. But we don't always do it. We know we should connect with others. We know we should be physically more active. We know we should eat well, drink three litres of water a day, perhaps learn a new skill to focus our mind. We know we should be giving to others, take regular breaks through the day. We should get enough sleep and practice mindfulness. But for some reason we don't do it and we can categorise those three things into the physical, the social and the mental. So why don't we do it? Well, three key things here. We often lack the motivation, the energy, or we're just not in the habit of doing those things. The motivation, the energy or the habit. So let's have a look at each three of those things very quickly. So motivation. I don't know about you, when I'm at work, if I say to my boss, I'm going to do something and there's a deadline, I'm accountable to them 
the other stakeholders I might impact uh, and I've made a public statement to say yes I'm going to do that. But if I say to myself I'm going to get up early this morning and go for a run and then I look out the window and it's a miserable grey day and I thought oh, I'm not going to bother. I'm only accountable to myself. OK, so it's easy to not make ourselves accountable to ourselves. It's easy to not go for that run or drink that glass of water. Sometimes we just don't see the point. We go, oh, well, it's not going to make a real difference. Or sometimes our goals are just unrealistic. Or if I go out running two mornings this week, I'll lose half a stone and, you know, look like an athlete. It's just not going to happen. So motivation can waver. Energy is a crucial factor in our ability to make some decisions. OK, so we could be in burnout uh, and underneath the word burnout, I've, I've written a, a sort of cycle of energy that we often have, particularly in work. So at best we're flourishing, we're energised, our heads up, we're interacting with people in a, and we're really producing great work. And then we can move into a fatigue state uh, which can lead to stress. And if that stress becomes elongated, it can become chronic and get to this place where we call burnout, where we've literally got no energy, dragging our limbs around, uh, and we can hardly be bothered to have conversations with people. Then hopefully out of that comes re recovery, re-energizing and back to flourishing. So it becomes a cycle. So knowing where you are on that burnout cycle is really crucial. Sometimes we just sit still too much, we're too sedentary. Uh, it's very easy to just sit in your office chair all day, particularly working from home. People feel a little bit of, uh, yeah, uh, I've got to show I'm working. I've got to show I'm productive, so I'm going to sit here all day and not take a break. It's really important that you do that. We don't you know, feed ourselves well enough or, or hydrate ourselves enough. And hydration is really, really crucial. Uh, three litres, they say, a day because you lose 1.7 litres of fluid just by breathing over a day. So if you're not at least doubling that with fluid intake, preferably water, preferably nothing uh, uh, less helpful than that, is crucial. Not enough sleep. Uh, and just generally feeling low, depressed, or we're not in a state of physical readiness. I did go out for a run the other day, tore my calf muscle, so I'm not in a physical position to go out and energise and get ready. I'm very frustrated about that. Sometimes we're just not in the habit. A habit is something we do without thinking. There's a cue, so in the mornings I get up, I get out of bed, I put the kettle on, I look at my phone, I look at the sports news and look at Facebook while I'm having my coffee. So there's a cue, there's some sort of routine and then there's the reward. OK, and we don't even think about. But habits uh, require determination to break. So you've got to notice what your habit is, choose to do something about it. And it takes at least 22 times of conscious decision making to change and form a new habit. So it's a bit of effort. So things else we can do is it's largely around reconnection. So I'm going to share with you in a minute a little bit of uh, theory, psychological theory about what you can reconnect with, what you can do physically, mentally, uh, socially, and then bring in the technology side of things, which is what this is all about. So there was a great bit of research done by a guy called Johan Hari, who said that stress and trauma is often linked to disconnection. Uh, and he says the way to address this is to reconnect ourselves with some key things. So one is meaningful work. So if we feel like overall what we're doing is really important, then that can help ground us and reconnect us with a positive mindset. Uh, and also meaningful values. Do we work for Hounslow Borough Council? Do we, do we have values in the right place? Is our heart in the right place? Are we doing things in the right way? We might not get everything perfectly, but largely we're doing things for the right reasons. Connecting with other people and of course that's harder virtually. Uh, I heard a nice phrase last night. I was on a seminar about emotional intelligence last night uh, and this guru of emotional intelligence called Dan Goldman said he doesn't like social distancing as a phrase. He says he prefers physical distancing because that's actually what we're doing, but actually we need to increase our social connection uh, 
rather than decrease it. So increase social connection and stay physically distant, obviously. Uh, reconnect with any stress, so don't pretend it's not there. Uh, just by talking about it, acknowledging can really help. But also the natural world, that sounds rather grand, but get out of the house if you can, if that's allowed in your tier three tier system. Uh, and also think about, do you have a hopeful or secure future that you can subscribe to? A lot of that has been swept away, of course, at the moment. That's harder to, but it's absolutely fun fundamental. If we feel we're secure, if we feel we're rooted, then we can sway and go along with the flow a little bit as well and reconnect with our status and respect. Often that starts with ourselves. So reconnection is crucial. What can we do with the physical? Be active. We talked about nutrition and hydration. Take breaks regularly. And if you're not in the habit of doing it, I would diarise them. Put them in your diary. Make sure you don't do back to back bookings all day. It's a very easy thing to do and sleep. So I'm going to ask you another question now for the Q&A function. What is the minimum amount of sleep we should be getting? So best research suggests a night. So just type in a number in the Q&A. What's the minimum amount of sleep we should be getting every night? Eight hours. Yes, any, any advance or less than that? There are certain figures in history who have said, oh yes, I've flourished on four hours. I think Margaret Thatcher famously said something. Whether she flourished or not is, I guess, a matter of opinion, but uh, eight hours. Yeah, research, that's, that's the optimal amount between seven and nine hours. Uh, yeah, seven to nine hours is optimal. There's a brilliant book on this by a guy called Matthew Walker. Seven to nine hours, optimal. Uh, that's why I nag my daughter to get to bed. Uh, and obviously technology can really be unhelpful in terms of sleeping. So uh, best advice is to turn your phones, smartphones off, turn your technology off uh, an hour before bedtime. Um, it's not always possible, of course. Uh, my wife insists on watching the telly in bed, um, so I haven't won that battle yet, but um, that's good. Yeah, so try and factor some good sleep. Uh, you know, a good tip I had was um, no caffeine after 2 p.m. as well, because apparently it stays in your body for a good long time. So if you have trouble sleeping, it could be all sorts of reasons. Your mind's busy, it could just be you had a cup of cup of tea at four o'clock and it's still in your system or you've been watching Netflix till midnight and uh, yeah you haven't given your mind an opportunity to settle yet so uh, optimal sleep level seven to nine uh, hours a night is perfect and what can you do mentally so learn a new skill is something new so I have tried to take up during lockdown uh, yoga now I'm terrible at it uh, but it's become a new habit. Uh, I'm still inflexible, uh, but I'm a little bit better. So it's something I've given myself a little challenge, a little task. It's only 10, 15 minutes a day. Mindfulness. I'm not sure if you've been a, you're actually aware of what mindfulness, but it's the art. They do a lot of it in meditation, in yoga. But the idea is that you're present, you're in the moment. And the theory very quickly behind mindfulness is we're only ever at our best when we're present. And that means mentally present because I've been in many, many meetings virtually and face to face when that was allowed, where people have been in the room physically, but mentally they're somewhere else. And remember that we're 10,000 thoughts a day. We're very busy, our mind. So it's quite a difficult thing to be present not look back on what's just happened because we can't change that. OK, not get worried or distracted by that and not look forward, not worry about what we call catastrophizing what was going to happen in the meeting uh, after now or am I hungry or oh, I wonder what I'm going to have for tea tonight. Staying present, staying focused right now. It's quite a difficult thing to do. That's why for years meditators have chosen to do that. Uh, but it's a really good exercise uh, and doing some deep breathing is can be very helpful. 
and challenge your own thinking. This is crucial. OK, of those 10,000 thoughts a day, most of them are made up, bizarrely, particularly if they're in the future tense or in the past tense. OK, my my daughters all the time tell me, well, it, if I do that, then that will happen. OK, and a lot of us think in the future tense if I do that, but it hasn't happened yet. OK, so challenge your own thinking or when you look back at a meeting, sometimes we just label it and go, oh, that was terrible. That was a disaster. But if we challenge our own thinking, and say, well, actually, most of it was OK. Perhaps that bit of it uh, I could have been clearer about. Then we suddenly challenge our own thinking. So there's all sorts of things we can do to help our mind be realistic and help our overall well-being. And so we move on to technology. Obviously, there's lots of things and how that can help. There are apps, there are podcasts, if that's your preference, websites, of course, there's reading and obviously you can read a book like I like to do or there's audio books, of course, and social interaction. Just, you know, get on FaceTime or your your platform of choice and have a chat to somebody because I don't know about you. Uh, the thing that's gone uh, disappeared from workday interaction is is the fun. The mucking about the social, the gossip, you know, did you watch Shane Ritchie last night? You know, what do you think of Jordan North, etc. All of those. <laughs> you can see we're a celebrity household. I'm not going to make a, a Bake Off spoiler for anybody who's not watched it, but I can't believe they won it. Um, but beware with technology as well. Slight caveat, it's, it's rarely the only answer. So let me share with you uh, a bit of research into some some things and and that can really helpful help you so we did some apps you know, there's an app called be okay which is about breathing exercises particularly if those that suffer anxiety and panic it just slows the world down for you and can really help okay and in that you can even dial in to somebody to speak to okay headspace is about sleep and meditation there are journal apps. One is Dalio, which is a journal to write everything down. So something about acknowledging and writing down your thoughts and your moods can be quite cathartic and put it there in black and white in front of you. Rebente is a CBT tool. So CBT is cognitive behavioural therapy uh, and self-improvement tips, but it can be a really helpful thing. So we have in, in CBT, we have this cycle of thoughts, feelings, behaviours, outcomes, thoughts, feelings, behaviour, behaviours, outcomes. And actually you can choose to do, uh, to make some decisions around all of those points around your cognitive behavioural therapy cycle. So I can choose my thoughts, I can manage my feelings, I can certainly choose my behaviours and I can focus on realistic outcomes. So all sorts of things there. Calm, harm, uh, offers distraction games, so sometimes just distraction, and then you come back to a task can be a really helpful thing to do. That's why people who are suffering grief, they get busy because they don't want to focus on it. They want to focus on something else. Uh, and when we come back to a situation, uh, we have a slightly different perspective. Calm is a very well known app, uh, meditation to track how you're feeling. And mood notes again is a, a just recording how you're feeling honestly so you can acknowledge any patterns etc and rooted as well you go how do you stay rooted through moments of stress anxiety panic and worse so there's some apps there are many more of course that you can choose podcasts so slow mo is uh mo gaudat's podcast where he talks a lot about uh you know, people's obstacles to happiness. Uh, you know, there's, you know, funny, funny stuff around depression, uh, you know, and how you can deal with that in a lighthearted way. Happy place is another one and also feeling better, live more. So, you know, just sharing, hearing these stories, you can you can empathize with those. So podcasts are good. You could even listen to them while you're running or your activity of choice. Uh, books, Lost Connections is Johan Harry's book about uh, how we can lose connections and reconnect. Mo Gadat's book, Soul for Happy, is much more detailed than I've given you. Quite a famous book called, by Dr. Steve Peters is called The Chimp Paradox. A lot of uh, sports people use this. 
to help manage their stress and get their mindset in a positive place. So people like Ronnie O'Sullivan and Sir Chris Hoy have used some of the tips and the chimp is the metaphor for the brain and how it operates either on an instinctive level or on a slower, more thoughtful level. And then you've got uh, Seth Godin's thing about asking you questions about, that you wouldn't ask yourself to really reveal things. And you've got websites and phone numbers as well. So share with you some of those things. But well, I want to obviously tailor this as much as possible. I've thrown a lot at you in a short space of time. So we've got a few minutes now for any questions uh, or comments. Obviously, they don't have to be a question. Um, that you want to throw open so we can make this session as useful as possible for you. And yes, we can send we can send the list to you, the slides to you afterwards. Um, and it's, it's it's a great thing. You've got to find what works for you. But technology is a great help and enabler. So if you don't have the opportunity to pick up the phone or uh, have a chat with somebody, that's where the apps and podcasts can come in. So I'll just leave a moment or two to see if there's anything else. Somebody made a comment. Totally agree. No fun anymore. I hope that wasn't me you were talking about. But uh, uh, yeah, no, the, the workplace can be quite drudging. <laughs> Maybe it is. I'll get the feedback later. But uh, yeah, we've got we, we've got to muck about. I believe in mucking about. Uh, and I think, you know, staring at a screen doesn't is not necessarily conducive. To, to moments of lightness in our lives. Uh, thank you, Anonymous. Uh, I'll I'll pay you later for that comment uh, for that. But um, OK. Maybe you've had enough of my droning on, um, but um, of course, I will we'll make the slides available and the resource list available to you all. And um, I really hope this session is useful for you. It's something we do at Me Learning a lot now. We work on the digital learning as well, but also, you know, how we can make ourselves better. I guess one takeaway from me is, you know, we we think about well-being in terms of self and others. Um, think about the last time you got on an aeroplane. And for me, it was first week, first week of March, actually. First week of March, I, I was flying to and from Warsaw. That seems a, a long time ago. And um, on the safety notice, they always say, uh, you know, if you have a child with you, put your own life jacket on first before you look after those others. And that's the absolutely core principle of well-being. You have to start with yourself. OK, because if you don't look after yourself, it's very, very hard to look after those around you. OK, so start with yourself. Be kind to yourself is the crucial thing. And then we're much more likely to have a heads up and our empathetic ear around us. Ah, so a few more comments. When you. No, your comments on the workplace, it's all work and no play now. Yeah, so uh, can you can you find a moment in your day to take a break? I don't know, watch something that makes you laugh. Um, it's more common wise that shows. I, you know, I was, I was laughing at more common wise last week. Always makes me laugh. Find something that always makes you laugh. When you feel burnt out, what do you do next? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, there's no one answer. I guess it starts with acknowledging the reality of it. Uh, and and trying to do a little bit of self discovery, I would encourage. So, for you, burnt out will show up differently to me feeling burnt out. So, uh, ask those around you, people you trust, for a little bit of feedback. How am I? How am I showing up right now? Uh, and then you can start to make decisions around that. So that would be the starting point. And then I guess I don't know you, whoever posted that comment. You can make some decisions a little bit. I'm afraid it's try and error, but the first thing is to acknowledge. To find out how you show up and of course we're not the best judge of how we show up. I I, I had some I keep talking about my daughter, so apologies for that, but uh, um, just over four years ago. Here's a, here's a bit of uh, a true story for you. We were going on a Halloween party and I was making up my daughter for a Halloween party and I finished, you know, she had a witch's costume. I'm not very artistic, but I did my best and I had the obligatory scary Vickers costume on 
And then I said, Libby, uh, do I need any makeup on as well? And she said, no, Dad, you've got a scary enough face as it is. So uh, uh, out of the mouth of, of babes, they tell you the truth. And uh, uh, joking aside, um, I didn't know that. And apparently I asked colleagues at the time and they said, yes, you can look rather serious uh, and stern when you're in thinking mode. And I di genuinely didn't know that. I, I, I rarely feel stern, but apparently I look it. So that was a good bit of feedback. That's how I show up to the world and I can make a decision to smile more uh, or intimidate people more if I choose. I'd never do that. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and pocket size reminders good yeah yeah uh, yeah that's a real that's a real thing people are frightened to to put their hands up and and say i've got too much work to do so i don't i don't know your ex, you know example um whether there are whistleblowing services whether there's that's a systemic thing it's quite a hard thing to do might be just in your particular team or again challenge your own thinking is that you telling yourself you can't do it or actually there may be a vehicle by which you do it i i can't answer that personally i'm afraid um but those are the questions you can ask yourself i think we're running out of time the question and answer panel has uh, gone very quiet so i really hope that's useful for you it's been uh, a great privilege to rabbit on at you for all this time and uh, um, thank you chris for inviting paul myself and me learning to the event thank you thank you very much roger and, and paul for coming along it was really interesting really valuable um for everyone here uh we'll be putting a recording on our sharepoint site and our youtube channel as well so you can watch back and get friends or colleagues too if they've missed it Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank all. you guys. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.